Hello. Ah, hello. Hold hi. on. Let me put this in. Hello. Hi, I'm 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 Keith Baker. I'm uh the one that is introducing you today. And I wanted to just to speak with you a few minutes before we get started. I actually don't even know how to pronounce your name. Is it Jörg Bewersdorf? Oh, very good. Yes, excellent. Yes. Okay, is Bewersdorf or or or? Yeah, Bewersdorf is, is uh, most correct. But I I developed a very high level of tolerance there. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Jörg, thank you very much for agreeing to to join us here. Um, um, well, thanks for the invitation. I wanted to uh, just to uh, also. Um, run by the introduction that I wanted that I had proposed to give uh, of you and to make sure that if you wanted if you had another introduction that you wanted by all means you can correct me in the few minutes we have left but it had to do with your uh, education in physics uh, you have a German physics uh, diploma and a, which is a PhD and a PhD equivalent degrees in the Department of Physics and Astronomy from the University of Heidelberg and yep. Your research is in optical physics and bio, and and you continue that even now in optical physics and biophysics as a member of the Yale uh, Medical School. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, you have um, uh, you uh, let's see, how do I say this? You have uh, appointments in the departments of cell biology and biomedical engineering, and Yale's integrated graduate program in physical and engineering biology. And I was really happy to see that you're an expert in, in instrumentation sciences, and uh, that this is something that is wonderful. Uh, and and um, so, um, um, uh, I, you were a past coordinator of the Yale Instrumentation Day. So there's that. And then I wanted to uh, just to to point out that uh, well, okay. Then there's uh, the information on your CV. I don't think I need to give the dates, but I can. The dates of your uh, your your PhD and uh, you've been here at Yale since uh, nineteen. Let's see, ninety. Uh, no, two thousand nine. I'm sorry, not nineteen ninety. Yeah, two thousand. Sorry, two thousand and nine. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and you're in the School of Medicine, Department of Cell Biology, and you are also in the Kavli Institute for Neuroscience, as well as the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Then um, that and uh, of course your honors and awards. Uh, you were awarded uh, the Kingsley Fellowship in Medical Research, 2009. Um, you had uh, a plenary talk at the annual meeting of the Microsoft. Tropical Society of Canada in 2011. Yeah, I, I don't think those are so relevant here for this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. All right, then I will leave it at that. And uh, you're, uh, yeah, okay. Then I'll, I'll leave it at that. It should be a relatively quick introduction, I guess. So thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Was there anything that you wanted me to uh, add to that or anything? No, no, I think that's, that's pretty complete. Okay, well, thanks. So can you try posting your slides so I can make um, sure that yeah. they work here? Uh, let's see. I don't know if I need to give you share screen. screen. Ah, uh, yeah, good. And then um, good. start. Uh -huh presentation and you do swap the screens where's the button display swap yeah now it should work okay very good okay excellent excellent and uh, can you thumb through it just to make sure that it uh yeah okay very good very good all right we're ready to go then so so um I guess uh, uh, you already know that uh, uh, this is um, for people from different departments will show up, uh, physics, applied physics, uh, uh, astronomy, mathematics, even sometimes they show up. And maybe some of your colleagues from the medical school as well. I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. You never know. Okay. And uh, we'll have mainly grad students, postdocs, and 
uh, research faculty, research staff, and, and um, uh, faculty here. Uh, so um, we'll see how it goes. So typically we start at a few minutes after four. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think I call that the Yale five minutes. So <laughs> okay. okay, good. All right, good. And what is uh, what is the typical length? Uh, just so that I'm not going, I, I was anticipating 45 minutes or so, but yep. um, yeah. Does yeah. it sound good? Okay. Yeah. And um, some speakers allow people to ask questions during the talk. I think formally, we probably wait until the end of your talk. So after 45 minutes, then we'll ask if there are questions, but it's up to you how you want to handle it. I'm, I'm fine either way, but I, I know via Zoom, this is always a little bit kind of, uh, the, the interruption don't, don't work as well, maybe. As That's right. Does, or I, people are a little bit more hesitant to interrupt there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. So then what if I tell them, if you have a burning question, you will allow uh, a question during the talk, but otherwise we'll wait until the end of your talk and then invite questions. That sounds great, yeah. Okay, all right, good. All right, so we'll give it a, 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 just a few more minutes. Should I uh, leave that? Uh, should I continue sharing my screen, or you want to uh, be uh, bigger for no, that? No, that's fine. You can continue to to share your screen. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Are you able to do a uh, full screen with with your uh, slide, or is this uh, is this already full screen? Uh, I think it is full screen. Um, says, is, does it not show? Uh, I can uh, stop and share again. Is this not appearing as a full screen? Uh, Let well, me try. I'll, I'll stop. I sharing. think Yarg. I think it's fine actually. Okay. It's just okay. a little. Um, the aspect ratio is a little different than the window, but I think that depends on how you, what you do with your screen on your computer. So you're okay. all, our, what we do on our computers. Okay, yeah, so this is a wide, like a 16 to nine. Yeah, it's fine, I think. Okay. I don't... Okay, then we'll go with this then. Okay. Uh, okay, then I guess, um, then we can get started if, if you like. So let me let me introduce you. So I I welcome everyone to uh, this uh, physics club, uh, where we have our guest speaker is Professor Jörg Biersdorf. Uh, he's uh, has uh, appointments in the Yale School of Medicine and um, his uh, and and other departments that I come to. So. Even though he's, uh, I shouldn't say even though, in a, uh, he's, he's, he has a, a medical background, but his education was in physics and he has a German uh, physics diploma. He has a PhD equivalent degrees from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Heidelberg. And his current research is in optical physics and biophysics, and it's still connected to what he did uh, for his uh, PhD in, in, in the Department of Physics. Um, his... Uh, uh, current is existing appointment here at Yale is in the Department of Cell Biology, that's his home department, and Biomedical Engineering, as well as uh, Yale's Integrated Graduate Program in Physical and Engineering Biology. He has also uh, has a strong uh, background in instrumenta instrument sciences and instrumentation, and 
Uh, he's been involved with the Yale Instrumentation Day, uh, even a past uh, co-organizer co uh, co of the Yale Instrument Day. Um, Yerk joined the faculty. He, he actually came to Yale University, I should say, as an assistant professor in 2009. And, current, and uh, he currently, in addition to the Yale School of Medicine, uh, he's uh, also a part of the Kavli Institute for Neuroscience. And as I said earlier, the Department of Biomed Biomedical Engineering. So um, we're looking forward to your talk and the title on biological far field microscopy beyond the diffraction limit of light. So your, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. And uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Keith. Uh, this is a, is a pleasure to be here. I'm, as, as Keith mentioned, I'm a physicist by training um, uh, and uh, have always been in a physics uh, department until I came to the United States, essentially. And uh, I'm, 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 I, ho I hope I can connect back to my roots here um, through this talk here. So, um, and uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, during the middle of the talk, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. I know this is a little bit difficult via Zoom, so it's equally fine to just ask at the end. Uh, but if, if there's anything which really stops you from understanding, like uh, uh, my my slide or so, don't don't hesitate to to speak up. But I will not be able to see your your comments, and uh, so don't type it, but speak up. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll want to cover today a little bit what uh, my research is, is uh, about here uh, in the Department of Cell Biology in my group. And uh, I'll here start on a big scale uh, with uh, giving you an overview of the structures that we, we deal with here on, uh, in our universe, right? They cover uh, tens of orders of magnitude here of size scales. And even, uh, and we have developed as physicists instrumentation over the last centuries to really um, um, approach and observe uh, um, phenomena in, on any of these size scales. And the same is true uh, also when it comes to uh, the size scales of life. Um, even though it doesn't cover such an Im impressive uh, range, it still covers about 10 orders of magnitude. And uh, when we want to uh, uh, observe below about 100 microns of size scale, we, we are using microscopes that uh, have been developed over the decades and centuries. Um, we are dealing primarily between uh, uh, or separating here between light microscopes and electron microscopes in a, from a practical perspective. Um, and uh, the light microscope uh, is unfortunately here limited in resolution to a, a couple of hundred nanometer in size scale uh, by uh, the diffraction limit. And this is what uh, my presentation today is about, how uh, about methods that allow you to overcome this diffraction limit in light microscopy. And uh, I'll show you also a few examples of, um, of what we can then um, do with these uh, newer um, microscope techniques. Uh, but first, uh, a brief here reminder of the diffraction limit, which is probably not really necessary in the physics department, but nonetheless. Um, and the diffraction limit is, is, is well known, well understood for uh, like uh, yeah, since the 19th century. And uh, we can summarize it here in very simplified terms that structures in small, smaller than half the wavelength uh, of light or any wave uh, cannot be resolved. And this is reflected, for example, here in the radius of uh, the area disk um, that you can see here, which is about half the wavelength divided by this numerical aperture which is the product of the refractive index and the sign of this aperture angle of our optical system here. And as physicists, of course, we immediately think when it comes to how can we get that diffraction limit smaller? Well, let's just lower the wavelength. Um, and indeed, that works, right? We know when we go from visible light to X-rays, like your soft X-rays, or if you go down to electrons and think of electrons, by their de Broglie uh, wavelength, we, uh, we can get better and better resolutions here. It's not scaling at the same scale as the wavelength um, because we can't maintain these high numerical apertures of about one that we can achieve in light microscopy. But nonetheless, we get uh, one order, two orders, or even more than two orders of magnitude below uh, what we can achieve with a light microscope. Uh, yet, 
about 95% of imaging applications in the biological sciences is done with light microscopy. Why is that the case? Uh, and the reason I think uh, is, is rooted in, in uh, the strengths that fluorescence uh, microscopy offer us. Um, in fluorescence light microscopy, we can label our biological structure with specific fluorescent probes uh, for targets of interest. Uh, we can do that uh, for all kinds of targets. Uh, we can do it uh, highly specifically, as I mentioned. We can do multiple colors. For example, we can highlight mitochondria in one color and the cytoskeleton in the microtubules in another color and then look at their uh, correlation and interaction. It's extremely sensitive down to the single molecule level and it's fully live cell compatible. So we can actually observe a cell as how it works uh, and uh, are not limited to static images here. It also works really well in 3D imaging and we can look inside a cell. We're not limited to observing the surface um, and uh, sample preparation is, is uh, comparably easy uh, compared to, for example, electron microscopy where we need to embed samples in, in a in a resin, uh, and work with vacuum, etc. So fluorescence microscopy really has many, many strengths, uh, uh, but it also is limited by diffraction, as uh, I pointed out earlier. Um, yet we want to go to a smaller size scales in imaging because uh, of this fascinating world be below about 100 nanometers. So the diffraction limit limits us to about 250 nanometers. So now we want to go down. Uh, below that by a factor of two to 10. So, And uh, here are just a few um, protein complexes or, or cellular structures at this 100 nanometer or below scale, the nucleopores, for example, which, which are the, the tunnels that connect the, uh, the inside of the nucleus with the, cyt the cytoplasm of the cell. They are small viruses like this bacterial uh, phage. Um, the needle complex in bacteria, which is responsible for injecting RNA or DNA into a, a, a cell that uh, uh, it wants to infect, uh, or synaptic vesicles, which carry uh, um, um, and neurotransmitters in, 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 our, in, in the chemical um, communication in the brain. All these are on the tens of nanometer size scale and are not accessible uh, to light microscopy as it in its diffraction limited form. So this really provides a strong motivation for to develop techniques that can, can overcome this diffraction limit in light microscopy, yet are still maintaining the, uh, the strengths and, 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 and um, capabilities that the standard light microscope offers that I just mentioned on the previous slide. So we call these um, techniques um, nanoscopy techniques or, or super resolution microscopy techniques. Um, I'm, I'm using these two terms interchangeably, so please don't get confused there. Um, and we are uh, going from about 250 nanometers into the 10 nanometer range fairly easily. And there are even a few more advanced techniques I will not cover today, which even go down to the single nanometer range here. Um, but in a factor of 10, is, is currently certainly uh, within the capabilities, for example, in my lab. The, uh, this topic of super resolution optical microscopy um, uh, is quite diverse. There are quite a lot of different approaches how uh, one can really improve the um, resolution limit in uh, the far field uh, fluorescence light microscope. Um, and I want to give you here a little bit of a, a rough overview here. Um, the first group of techniques I would summarize as techniques which push the resolution within the diffraction limit. You emphasize spatial frequencies that are uh, on the extreme end of uh, what the diffraction limit allows, and thereby you can kind of squeeze out a, another factor of about two in resolution there. You're optimizing essentially your uh, your your um, um, diffraction limit. Uh, there are uh, here are a few uh, kind of uh, names that appear in this, this group here. Most of them are probably not familiar with you, and I, I don't want to read them to you here. But in case some something kind of uh, um, um, yeah uh, rings a bell there. The second group of techniques really break the diffraction limit of light, um, and they do so 
by 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 switching fluorescent molecules on and off. We can do it in a spatially targeted manner, or we can do it in a in a random manner where we look at single molecules and localize them. And um, this has been uh, uh, um, honored by a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014. Um, and I'll, I'll cover these techniques here um, in more depth in the next minutes. And then the, the last approach, which is a fairly new one invented in 2015, is actually a, I would say, less physical approach, more chemical approach. And that is a way that you just enlarge the sample and thereby make it easier to image. And we call that expansion microscopy. Um, what's interesting and why I chose this, this, uh, this uh, division into these three groups is that the, the philosophical or conceptual approach, how you can overcome the diffraction limit or get a better resolution is, is quite different. Uh, in the first group of techniques, we are really focusing on like light, sculpting light, making a focus sharper, uh, these kind of things. Um, the second group uh, of techniques is based on the on the realization that you can't beat the diffraction limit on its own turf. Uh, you need to think of the microscope in a more uh, general. Uh, term and you need to include the sample into the system uh, and it's the sample light interactions uh, uh, utilizing these interactions in a, in a clever manner that allows you to break the diffraction limit and really get better by about a factor of 10 or even more and the last group of techniques i, I briefly mentioned already is, is really focusing completely on the sample and uh, ignores the microscope it's, it's, uh, and, and just says how can we uh, modify our sample to make it easier uh, to observe um, the resolutions, uh, resolution improvements here are, are summarized stuff here. Get the, uh, not surprisingly, the best resolution improvement factors here in the, in the, um, in the second and the third group. And I'll show you examples of uh, these improvements later. Uh, today, I want to um, cover what we are dealing with in my lab. Uh, and these are here boxed uh, in red. Uh, and as you can see, they are uh, from all of these different techniques, the full pi microscope technique we are implementing here in the second group here, and I'll show you an example of that later. And what the lab is, is uh, I'm coming from the optical physics uh, field. I work a lot with instrumentation development, uh, and we focus on op developing optics. We focus on developing kind of a, a precision mechanics, um, um, but there is also, it's quite an interdisciplinary field, and we also need to work on algorithms, we need to work on sample optimization, on stainings, on uh, new fluorescent probes, uh, and then collaborate very closely with our cell biological colleagues on, on applying these um, uh, instruments on cell biological questions by medical uh, uh, research. Our focus today, though, on the more physics uh, connecting uh, elements here. Good. So um, here I've I have structured the remainder of my talk in, in three different groups. Uh, the first one will focus on the STET microscope, which is one of these uh, techniques here um, in, the, in the second category. And then I'll talk about uh, these single molecule localization techniques. I'll give you one example there. And towards the end, if time permits, I'll, I'll talk to you about expansion microscopy, which is the newest addition to the techniques that we are uh, working on in the lab. Okay, so the step microscopy is all about breaking the diffraction limit by uh, targeted off switching of uh, fluorescent molecules. So uh, the principle here, um, the principle of step nanoscopy for, for this, you really need to get into the energy diagram of the fluorescent probes that uh, we are using um, or the Jablonski diagram here. We have the electronic ground state, we have the electronic excited state, we have uh, vibrational levels here. And uh, the normal fluorescence excitation emission cycle looks like this. Uh, light is absorbed, uh, um, goes from the electron ground state, vibrational ground state, usually at room temperature, up to a uh, kind of here the higher uh, uh, first electronic uh, excited state and higher vibration levels will relax very quickly here uh, through uh, um, um, by bumping into a kind of uh, molecules in the neighborhood. Remember, we are not in, in the vacuum here. And then um, it will uh, emit spontaneously fluorescence after a couple of nanoseconds, will send out a fluorescent photon. 
and, and it ends up again in a higher vibrational state because of the Frank Condon principle. So um, we can now excite or illuminate that same molecule with a second laser beam and stimulate emission. And this is uh, kind of to this crowd easy to explain since uh, we all are familiar with the concept of the laser, which of course is, is built on that concept. Uh, so if you illuminate this excited molecule with a step laser, as we call it, a stimulant emission depletion laser, we can deplete these excited molecules, force them down into the ground state and uh, prevent the emission of a spontaneously emitted photon, uh, which we would call fluorescence. Um, so how, so we have found a way to switch the molecule off for preventing its emission of fluorescence in a way. Um, uh, and uh, how do we now apply this in a super resolution microscope manner? How do we improve the resolution with it? Um, we implement it into a laser scanning microscope. We have an exci a diffraction limited excitation focus. And if that excitation focus would uh, focus, let's say in a solution of fluorescent molecules, we'll good get an area which also would be diffraction limited from which fluorescence would be emitted. Um, and that's what we would observe. And then we scan the focus to, uh, um, to uh, image a sample, uh, image our sample. In the STAT microscope, we use that same excitation focus, but we overlay a ring-shaped uh, STAT laser focus here uh, on top of our excitation focus. Um, the depletion uh, will now happen dependent on the intensity of that uh, uh, red laser here. Um, and we can thereby switch off molecules in the outer areas of the excitation focus, but we, we, remain, we, we don't touch the ones in the center of, the, uh, of that donut here. So we'll end up with a slightly improved uh, um, uh, spot size from which fluorescence can be uh, emitted. Um, the effect is not very uh, impressive because, as you can imagine, the, the hole here in this ring profile is also diffraction limit. Um, so we haven't really, we have only replaced one diffraction limit by another diffraction limit here. Uh, but we can now um, really uh, take advantage of the uh, saturating or nonlinear um, phenomena of, of that um, depletion process. Um, so if you plot the emitted fluorescence as a function of that intensity of this red laser here. Um, obviously, the uh, fluorescence signal will go down, down, down. Uh, but then it will, of course, level off uh, here towards zero. And we get a very strong uh, kind of saturating uh, behavior here. So if we crank up the red, red laser intensity, our depletion profile uh, will look something like this here. Uh, we, um, if the, think of that laser intensity here and the peak here being somewhere off my chart here, off my screen to the right. And then even 10% of that intensity is still sufficient to deplete 95% of the molecules. So we now end up with a very, very small hole, which we uh, engineered very carefully so that it really has as close to zero intensity as possible. And, uh, and thereby, we can really um, create a subdiffraction uh, focus, uh, which can be 10 times or so smaller than the uh, uh, spot, spot size here. And this equation here, I think, highlights very nicely that we have really beaten the diffraction limit. Yes, we still have here the diffraction limit in our um, equation here. It's still lambda over two times the numerical aperture. Um, but we have added it or modified it now with the square root term. And in the square root, we have the maximum intensity of this donut here uh, divided by the characteristic saturation intensity at which 50% uh, of the flow force are, um, uh, are depleted. And this is also a nice, I think, reminder of, of this, how we, are, we have moved from a purely optical consideration to, an, to a light sample interaction uh, perspective. These... Yeah, I have a question here. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's beautiful. <laughs> so, the only thing that I wanted to ask is about the formula, so the equation. <laughs> so it looks like you can crank up IMAX and getting better and better uh, resolution. But I thought that, you know, if you crank up it so much that you um, you suppress fluorescence even at article zero, then it should vanish. So I, I'm a bit surprised that there is no threshold 
or the intensity. Yeah, so, so threshold, or which you, you should not go because you'll just extinguish all the molecules. So the I, I, and you're raising a very important practical point. So in practice, you're absolutely right. In theory, here um, the donor profile we can we can sculpt the, uh, that donut shaped laser focus to have a zero intensity in the center. So then it's it remains zero uh, no matter how much we amplify. Uh, uh, that that signal here, and in that case, you can really there is no limit, right? In practice, you're right. In practice, we will never be able to uh, to make a donut profile which is that perfect. It will always have one percent or half a percent or so intensity in the middle, and and that's our practical limit in practice. So, uh, but in theory, if you can really create a donut profile so perfect that it there is no intensity in the middle, uh, then then you're not limited. I see. And what what in practice limits the uh, the zero ness of zero? And uh, what what it, uh, what us, uh, limits us in practice is the, that it's not perfectly. We will never be able to build a perfectly symmetric um, uh, microscope. Um, so we'll not get a perfect uh, cancellation in the middle. And then there's also scattering effects um, uh, where, yeah, light can be kind of scattered towards the center. Yeah. Thanks. So um, we have now a lot of optical properties in here, right? Wavelength, refractive index, aperture angle, and the intensity of our laser. But we also have one photochemical or photophysical property in here, and that's the saturation intensity, which actually depends on the sample, not the microscope. And I think this, this I think, uh, brings very nicely together that, that it's really here the, the sample light interaction, which allows us to break, break the diffraction limit. Okay, so that's the, the concept here uh, of the STAT microscope. Um, how do we implement that in, a, in an instrument? Um, we have here an objective lens. It's a laser scanning microscope. Uh, we have an excitation focus, uh, excitation beam being focused here by the objective lens into diffraction limited focus. We detect fluorescence being emitted from that focus back here with a photomultiplier tube, usually through a pinhole to suppress out of focus light. And then we couple in a second step laser, a second laser beam, the step laser, which we shape into a donut uh, profile by putting in a, a face mask here, which uh, is a zero to two pi phase delay here over one rotation. Um, the uh, we need to consider the wavelength here we're dealing with. Um, so we have here a typical excitation spectrum, typical emission spectrum. I apologize for not providing any units down here. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, think of this here being uh, about 500 nanometers, uh, being this about 600 nanometers or so wavelength. And uh, we would excite here with the, the blue laser here, somewhere around the peak of the excitation spectrum, the fluorescence emission. We try to capture as much as possible since fluorescence signals are weak. And the STED laser, we, we choose uh, here on the right edge, on the red uh, shifted edge of our emission spectrum, enough to overlap with uh, the, the transition here uh, between the excited and the uh, uh, state and the um, electronic ground state, uh, but uh, far enough away that it's not overlapping here with the excitation spectrum and not doesn't re-excite our molecules. And uh, here's, a, here's the phase pattern um, here in a, in a different um, visualization. This donut is a two-dimensional donut. It, it looks like this if in our focal plane. If you look at it from the side, uh, you can see that it's actually not a, not a three-dimensional hole in the middle. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a cylinder or like a, an axis here uh, in, on, along the z-axis uh, where the um, molecules don't get uh, depleted. Okay, and this is then the re, um, final points of function after excitation and depletion. In the confocal case, you get something like a football shape. The objective would sit here underneath here. And in the stead case, it looks more like a cigar shape. And I'll show you later that there are other kinds of face masks possible to create other kinds of uh, donut or depletion profiles. So one more technical detail I thought uh, uh, could be of interest to you. We are typically using um, pulsed uh, laser systems. It's not strictly required, but it, uh, makes the system a little more, more efficient. So we use a pulsed excitation laser at 80 megahertz. 
uh, of the, these pulses are 50 picoseconds or so long, so not ultra short. And uh, each of these pulses will excite fluorescence, which will then uh, in, in bulk or um, uh, decay here with an exponential um, um, decay um, with a lifetime of two to four nanoseconds or so. And we'll now um, uh, add our step pulse to deplete uh, the molecules right after our excitation pulse. And uh, we then use a gated detection uh, in, with our photomultipliers or other detectors to only detect fluorescence after the stat pulse had a, had a chance to interact with the sample. So um, it, the advantages are that we can concentrate the stat laser power to the time when it's most needed. Uh, we can suppress also background here. Many of the fluorescence or light coming back from the sample is, is, uh, has a much shorter lifetime or no lifetime if it's scattered light. Uh, so we can suppress these contributions um uh yeah and uh and uh, we are also only detecting fluorescence after the stat uh, laser had a chance to act with the same and uh here is a kind of simplified optical diagram of that setup uh, here's an objective we use several excitation lasers so that we can do multicolor imaging um and uh, they are here directed into the sample through uh, these um, scan mirrors so for laser scanning um our um, these lasers are pulsed, um, and then uh, we detect fluorescence here with avalanche photodiodes, uh, single photon counting avalanche photodiodes, and we uh, gate the detection here. And then uh, we use our STED laser at uh, typically 775 nanometers, which is also pulsed and synchronized to these lasers. And we send this via, uh, we, we shape that laser with a spatial light modulator, like a, um, a liquid crystal device. And uh, that allows us to make the face mask, to make the donut profile, but it also allows us to do aberration correction for with uh, use it as a deformable, uh, uh, like an adaptive optics device. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here this is the scanner. We we have a very fast resonance scanner here to to uh, facilitate live cell imaging. Okay, so now uh, some experimental results here. Um, the, the standard test that uh, we are always doing when we build one of these microscopes, we image small fluorescent particles, these 20 nanometer beads, for example, uh, which are labeled with a with a fluorescent dye. And this would be uh, an image as, as uh, you see it with a normal confocal imaging mode. The, uh, this is about a two micron field of view here. Um, if you image that same uh, field of view now with that step laser turned on additionally, um, uh, this is what you see. And what I would like to point out here is that this is raw data. We are not, this is not processed or um, somehow mathematically enhanced here in the visualization. This is really the counts as our uh, avalanche photodiode detected them. Um, so it's really, as Stefan Hell here, who, the inventor of STEP microscope, would put it, it's, it's, it's uh, only physics, uh, not math here, that, uh, that is uh, leading here to the super image. Um, so if you measure here the points of function, the, the, the width here of uh, a single bead that we image, then in the confocal cases about 250 or 220 or so nanometers, uh, representing the refraction limit resolution. In the step case, this can be as small as 26 nanometers. It's really approaching here the, the bead uh, size here. So we can get about a factor of 10 or uh, roughly of resolution improvement uh, um, just turning on that step laser. A quick question. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so just so I understand the raw data, the axes are really just time. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Yes. So, so that uh, it's it's scanned like an like an old fashioned uh, mm -hmm. like a, Big a scan monitor, right? So it's it's scanned yeah. fast in the x direction, then and then slow in the y direction. Yeah. What line after line? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um. So the um, yeah, so that's uh, the the bead data, and then of course we want to apply this uh, here to a biological sample. And here we are looking at mitochondria in green and the endoplasmic reticulum in magenta, uh, using two different uh, fluorescent dyes. And uh, this is the regular confocal image, and this is the stat image um, um, obtained uh, directly afterwards. You see a certain granularity in the image here now. This is not 
the shot noise, even though we are we are approaching here the shot noise limit. This this is actually the uh, the granularity of the staining. We're using antibodies here against proteins which are located on the mitochondria or on the, on the endoplasmic reticulum, and these are distributed in a in a in a um, shot noise manner to some extent, right? They are not everywhere, and uh, and we are already now seeing kind of this this the clustering of these proteins on the on the membranes here of these organelles. And uh, the, I, I so said one of the strengths of fluorescence microscopy is that we can do live cell imaging. So of course, that's also what we want to do here. And this is a collaboration here with uh, Shreen Bamanyar in the MCBB department. And uh, there we imaged here the endoplasmic reticulum um, in, in a live cell. And this was here playing at, at the time, we, uh, at the same speed we recorded it. So we recorded it at four frames a second. You can see here that the endoplasmic reticulum is organized into sheets and tubules that is well known if you look at any cell biology textbook. Uh, but what we can observe here additionally is really these, these fenestrations, these, these uh, tunnels through the sheets of the ER. Um, and uh, and uh, what I think wasn't really appreciated, at least I didn't appreciate it until we saw these movies, is that how dynamic these structures are. Um, I mean, this is yeah within a second uh, a lot as, as happened here on uh, with the organelle um, morphology here. So I want to show you, this is a little bit older data. I want to show you a recent um, um, uh, um, development, which I think is maybe highlighting uh, nicely like the physics aspect here of, of uh, or yeah, the optical physics aspects here of our work. And uh, we, we have, we, one of the frontiers we have faced in set microscopy was that most applications were limited to uh, to very thin sections or thin areas. So like these cells, for example, you looked at where cells going on glass cover slip, the areas we imaged were maybe a one micron or two microns thick. Uh, but ideally, we would like to image uh, these structures on a live animal, like a mouse. So for example, we want to image in the mouse brain and want to see how neurons uh, change when a mouse learns. Uh, learn something, right? So it, it has to form new synapses. Synapses might get stronger or weaker. And, and we want to like observe that. And that's at the size scale that these microscopes can approach. The problems are that as soon as you go more than 10, 20, or 50 microns into tissue, you deal with scattering and you deal with uh, wavefront aberrations since the tissue is, uh, is not homogeneous in its refractive index. Uh, lipids and proteins have higher refractive index than the surrounding aqueous media. Um, and I mean, if you go to a grocery store and buy a piece of meat, right, you cannot see through it. So it's uh, there, there you have it. So, um, so the, the solution that uh, we have, so we have combined here several approaches we to do deeper tissue optical microscopy. And uh, this, these are summarized here. We have co combined two photon excitation that allows us to go to a longer wavelength of illumination light. And that reduces the scattering, which in the case of radius scattering is, is proportional to the wavelength to the power of minus four. So wavelength plays a huge role in, uh, with regards to scattering. Uh, we also have chosen to use far red fluorescent probes. So to bring the emission wavelength also more into the red. And then we uh, integrate adaptive optics uh, that uh, you've probably are, uh, that you're probably familiar with from the astronomy field uh, to reduce optical aberrations. And then uh, one small kind of technical detail is that we also apply using an objective lens, which has the focus far enough in front of the lens so that you can actually go deeper into a specimen without running with the lens into the into the into the mouse skull or something like that. Okay, so. To photon microscopy is really what it is, what it sounds like. So you are actually applying here the concept of having two photons absorbed simultaneously here by the molecule. Um, that is well established since the 1990s as a, as a fluorescence microscopy method. And uh, each photon now carries half the energy required. So if you have, uh, that means double the wavelength. Um, so if you normally would excite at 500 nanometers, you would now excite at 1,000 nanometers, and uh, you're going into the near infrared range now. Um, importantly, th this does not affect at all the uh, the stimulated emission. As as soon as the molecule has has reached here this um, um, vibrational ground state here, 
uh, it will have lost uh, any memory of how it got excited and uh, the stimulated mission and the fluorescence process work as well as, as they do with one photon excitation. Um, for the aberration correction, we are essentially borrowing the same approaches that astronomy uses for, for ground-based telescopes. Uh, here, we instead of correcting for aberrations by the atmosphere, we want to correct for aberrations introduced by the tissue. So if you have a perfectly collimated focus here or a beam of um, light being focused by the objective, it will get distorted. Uh, the wavefronts will get distorted by the tissue. And uh, it's now up to us to, um, if you know these uh, distortions, to pre-correct for them so that by the time we have reached the focus center, um, we are um, at the uh, kind of at, at a diffraction limited uh, uh, perfect focus again. So the question is, how do we know um, what that pre-correction has to be? And, and here, again, we are borrowing a, a concept of astronomy. We are producing, we are creating a, a nonlinear guide star in the tissue. We are, with our two photon beam, we can focus into the tissue uh, because of the quadratic dependence on the intensity, we'll only excite fluorescence in the focus and not uh, in the cone of light in front and behind the focus. And we are really creating the equivalent of a guide star in astronomy now. Um, we detect the wavefront aberrations from, emitted from that guide star with a Sheck Hartman uh, wavefront sensor. And then we are applying uh, the measured wavefront or the negative of the measured wavefront to our deformable mirror and thereby recover uh, the focus quality. So um, this is how this is integrated optically. And this is the stimulated emission or STET laser. Um, it will it's get reflected twice by the spatial light modulator, where we can apply uh, either this hologram that I showed to you earlier with a, with a um, 0 to 2 pi um, um, phase um, um, vortex here. Or, or we can apply the CO2 pi uh, top hat like profile. Um, we couple in the two photon excitation laser into the beam. They both are then uh, reflected by the deformable mirror. And the deformable mirror can correct for aberrations in both of these laser beams. And uh, we detect the fluorescence right here close to the objective uh, since um, the um, excitation already limits our excitation to the focal spot itself, we don't need a pinhole to filter out out of focus light. And that's a feature of the two photon excitation. And then the Sheck Hartman sensor we, we placed here behind the deformed mirror so that we can actually detect uh, whether the correction of the deformed mirrors or the wavefront aberration corrections we apply there are actually uh, um, creating a, a better wavefront here. We can monitor that directly. So uh, here are some experimental results. Um, I don't know, the window is a little bit in the way here. I can't see that. So in the regular two photon microscope, uh, these are uh, theoretical values here on the right, but the, the other ones are experimental ones. Um, uh, we would get about 350 nanometer XY resolution and about 1,100 nanometer in depth. Uh, this is not as good as values I showed to you earlier because the uh, numerical aperture of this objective is a little bit lower so that we can uh, focus deeper into, into uh, let's say, a mouse brain. And then if you apply this depletion profile I showed earlier, we can really get that down by about a factor of, what is that, five um, um, without affecting the Z resolution. But we can also apply this uh, uh, face mask, and then we create a step focus which has a uh, lobe above and below the excitation focus. And that allows us to improve the the axial resolution by about a factor of eight or so. Or we can mix these two by, uh, by um, applying an, an, an arbitrary ratio of intensities to these two um, profiles. And for example, as a compromise, get a resolution improvement of about a factor of three in, 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 in all three dimensions. Um, here is uh, our um, aberration correction uh, process. So we acquire the spot diagram with a Sheck Hartman sensor. We reconstruct the wavefront um, from that, apply the corrections with the deformed mirror. Uh, we can then check if the spot diagram indeed looks better uh, optionally and uh, can go through iteratively uh, more than once, but typically one time is enough. 
and then we acquire the corrected image here um, with our microscope. And here in the top left corner, you see the image as a, of a cell nucleus here, as it would look like without any aberration correction. You get a much clearer image, obviously, here uh, when you apply the aberration correction. Uh, in case you're interested, these are the, uh, so the magnitude of aberrations that we experience here. These are Zernike modes, and uh, we see primarily here uh, first order circle aberrations, the second order circle aberrations, and this is, I believe, some uh, astigmatism here um, that we have uh, observed here, and we are they, they are of the order of about one radiant uh, of um, amplitude here. And I think here are the comparisons. Uh, this is a three D data set. This is a X Y view. This is the side view, and I think you can appreciate how much better the image quality gets here. I'll have a, another example here now of the, uh, the brain structure here. And uh, you can see here uh, about 10 or so astrocytes in the mouse brain section. Oops. Uh, and um, uh, this is again a 3D data set. In the left, you would see the normal two photon microscope image, which is the state of the art uh, for, um, for brain imaging. On the right, you see our uh, two photon step image, which gives you a, a quite a dramatic uh, uh, resolution improved image. Okay. With that, I want to uh, come here to my second topic. And I, I think I, I realize now that expansion microscopy, including that was a little bit too ambitious, so I'll leave that out. Um, but here, I, this I, I would like to cover uh, in five or 10 minutes here. So uh, this is this second uh, field of uh, uh, switching uh, techniques uh, where we can uh, really break the diffraction limit. We call that single molecule localization microscopy. The acronyms for the different modalities are PALM or STORM or FPALM, you might have heard of these. And here we break the diffraction limit by stochastically switching of individual molecules. In the STEP microscope, we did it in a targeted manner, but they share that switching uh, concept. So uh, in this, uh, what you look at here is a, is a very simple um, simulation. Uh, we assume this is the structure we want to image, and it's labeled with fluorescent molecules. The diffraction limited image would look like that. Each molecule here is blurred by the diffraction limit to a, about a 250 nanometer wide point slit function. Uh, but if you would look at only, let's say, six molecules at once, then each of these molecules would appear like a uh, diffraction limit at a point slit function. But we could assume with a very high likelihood that these are individual molecules. So we can segment out the, uh, each of these uh, spots here and fit a model function to it, for example, a Gaussian, and then uh, just plot the center position from that fit in our image. Now, then we have the position of six molecules. And now that we make these molecules blink, we can do that in a photophysical or photochemical manner. And we image um, stochastic subsets of these uh, of our sample here, um, sparse subsets, uh, over, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 camera frames. And we combine our uh, the uh, localized molecules here in our final image, and thereby achieve over time a, a super resolution image. Um, we need to uh, uh, sort, and so this is computationally fairly intensive because we need to, uh, yeah, so here, for example, if you look at this, once in a while, molecules get too close together. And of course, in this case, we need to filter these out uh, so that we don't uh, or, or, or fit in a more sophisticated manner that we are not uh, plotting here the, the average position between these two molecules, which would be wrong. Um, so the precision with which we can fit here, uh, the position or determine the position uh, is, can be roughly approximated uh, with this equation. It's the width of our points at function divided by the square root of the number of photons. And that should come at no surprise. That's essentially uh, the same as uh, determining the, the um, the precision of a, of a mean value if you have a, a certain uh, width of a distribution. Um, the, uh, and this is the single molecule localization field has been around for 20, 30 years already um, as it was used for track to track particles, for example, why they move. And, and since 2006, it's, it's applied in this resolution manner. Um, in case you're interested, uh, what would this equation look like if we don't simplify it that far? Um, you can see here that in this approximation, you also have here the pixel size at some point playing a role. 
but actually not very strongly. It's here divided by 12 here compared to the uh, points of function size. And at some point in the background, this is also becoming a, a dominating factor and is really uh, um, killing our localization precision. But uh, I want to show you here a few applications, and I want to show you one which I find from a physics perspective particularly intriguing. So here we are looking at, uh, just to give you an idea of biological applications, we are looking here at the cytoskeleton of a cell. This is about half a cell. Uh, the other half would be uh, above the screen. Um, and uh, this was a diffraction limited image. This is now the super resolved image, which consists of four and a half or 4.4 million localized individual molecules. And uh, if you look into this area here, this was the camera uh, um, image that we took with a, a diffraction limited uh, performance and Nyquist sized pixels here. And uh, we can clearly get about a factor of 10 or so uh, resolution improvement uh, doing this approach. Here. The Resolution improvement is about a factor of 10, as I mentioned, better in x, y, and the z direction. Um, so we get about 20 or 30 nanometer in the x, y direction, but it's about a factor of three or so worse in the z direction. And the reason for that is that our points of function is also longer in the z direction as it is wide x and y. And the reason for that is uh, that we only observe our sample from one side. Um, from a, a physics perspective, uh, the reason why the focus is longer than it's wide is because we are actually covering less spatial frequencies in the axial, or we are observing less spatial frequencies in the axial direction than we observe spatial frequencies in the xy direction. And that uh, influences our um, uh, precision with which we can uh, uh, kind of localize here uh, the, the molecule. Um, a fairly straightforward uh, approach to, to solving this. Uh, or addressing this is by using two objective lenses. Um, and uh, we call that the so-called four pi uh, geometry from the inspired by the kind of the four pi solid angle that a sphere has. And, and here we now get an interference between the two objective lenses, a standing wave, if you like. Um, and, and that has a much sharper spatial features than the uh, original more football shaped uh, points of function. So this was initially developed as a just a regular confocal laser scanning microscope concept in the 1990s. Um, uh, but it has been applied also here in the single molecule localization field. And uh, you get a slightly better XY resolution because you now detect double the number of photons. Um, and But you get a lot of better Z resolution of about a factor of uh, five to seven or so better in the axial direction. So um, how does this work now? Um, so we have our two objectives here. And uh, let's see our single molecule emitting light here somewhere in the middle between the two objectives. And we combine the fluorescence here coherently at a beam sort of cube. So the fluorescence will now interfere. And let's say we uh, the, the path length here were such that we get constructive interference here uh, at this side of the beam sort of cube. For energy conservation reasons, then there's no light coming out on the other side of the beam sort of cube. Um, um, so this is always had a 180 degree phase uh, delay, um, phase, uh, phase separation between the two. Um, the, uh, this was for one polarization direction. We can get the same kind of images for the other polarization direction here, the P and the S polarized light. Um, and we can now do a trick here of introducing bio, different levels of birefringence in the upper and the lower beam path so that we have get uh, introduced another 90 degree phase delay here. So this is 0 and 180 degrees. This is 90 and 270 degree uh, phase delay. So we are now, uh, we now see four images. And depending on the interference phase, we'll get either constructive, destructive interference, or something in between. So we can measure these intensities now here at these four images. And if the particle now moves closer to one objective or the other objective, these uh, uh, intensities will change. And they'll, they'll, they will do so in a sinusoidal manner. Uh, and these we get four curves, which are separated or, or shifted by 90 degrees relative to each other. 
what is intriguing here about this, uh, at least when as a graduate student, when I first looked into this, I was very fascinated by that, is that if you think about what's interfering here, um, we are this is fluorescence light interfering, not laser light. And uh, two fluorescent molecules next to each other will not be uh, in sync. They will not emit light in a, in a coherent manner. So you see here interference of light being emitted by one fluorescent molecule. Even more so, even the fluorescent photons emitted subsequently by the same molecule will not be uh, phase locked. They cannot, cannot interfere either. So what's interfering here is really single photons with itself. So it's it's really single photon interference that uh, that uh, creates these interference patterns here. And we are doing that in a biological sample in a wet lab uh, in a kind of in, at room temperature. There's not, not no kind of, uh, we are not dealing here at, at uh, I don't know, close to zero Kelvin or a vacuum temperature, uh, vacuum or so conditions. Um, I'll, I'll show you the data in, in a minute. So um, this is uh, the setup, optically how it looks like. Here are our two objective lenses. Here's this beam sitter cube that you just saw. Uh, the, the quartz wedges are used to introduce the birefringence. And then we add again deformable mirrors for aberration correction. And then this optics here on the right is really just to redistribute these, uh, separate the asset from the p-polarization and, and create four images next to each other on the camera. Uh, this is how the optics the setup looks like. It's about as, as big as an as an office desk, um, and uh, the challenge here was primarily the on the precision side that these two objectives need to be positioned relative to each other with about ten nanometer precision in three D, and we also need to be able to move the sample with a, a few tens of nanometers precision or, or sub ten nanometer precision, so that we can uh, scan it carefully. Okay. So here's some raw data. Um, this is the blinking molecules that you can observe here. Uh, we introduce on purpose some astigmatism. So that's why some of these look uh, vertically, some horizontally stretched. Uh, that helps us with the depth discrimination. Uh, but I think you can, uh, this is about real time uh, playing how that data acquisition looks like. These are the four images. If you would uh, look carefully, uh, could look carefully here, you could see that the uh, these uh, different uh, intensity uh, uh, ratios will vary depending on which depth the molecule size. And uh, this is here one uh, example that we have imaged over the last couple of years, which really was for us a hallmark. This is the, the Golgi complex uh, imaged in a, in a cultured cell. The nucleus would be sit here. And the Golgi has a very uh, characteristic structure of stacked cisterna. It looks like a stack of pancakes, if you like, or several stacks of pancakes next to each other. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a hallmark structure which you find in any cell biology textbook, but which nobody ever could image with a light microscope, uh, because these cisterna are only about 30 to 50 nanometers separated. Uh, but now, uh, labeling the different cisterna in different colors uh, with different dyes, you can nicely see here the stacking of these cisterna. And uh, you can also appreciate how complex, while these individual here, these are individual stacks of pancakes, if you like, they are, uh, they are oriented in 3D, very complicated, and they're all uh, connected all and makes it very hard to integrate the structure in 3D. But I think it's, it's something where now, like my course, you really can help us answer questions in this area. OK, um, with that. I'm coming, I'll skip that last part. Maybe we can discuss that offline if you're interested, but I'll, I'll just come briefly here to the conclusion, uh, to my acknowledgments here. Uh, and then I'm... Um, present. Oh, there. Oops. Sorry, um, oh, wrong direction. Okay, so yeah, I would like to acknowledge here my, my lab members here for uh, uh, working with me on all these experiments. And as you can see, we also work very collaboratively. We depend a lot on our biological collaborators for providing us with the biological questions and biological samples. Um, and uh, we also work closely with Martin Booth at the University of Oxford, for example, on the formal, on the adaptive optics and uh, with other labs like um, Alana Shepard's lab, uh, I don't know. 
oh, I might have missed it here on, on a probe development, etc. And uh, thanks for your attention and sorry for going over here. I hope that's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Jörg. And uh, I uh, actually am really uh, happy to see this. I actually picked up some things that I didn't know. So thanks very much. Um, so we have time for questions. If uh, anyone wants to uh, raise their hand and let me know if they have a question or let Jörg know if you have a question. Let's see, uh, Charles, um, uh, yeah. Am I saying it right? Uh, Charles Lomba? Oh, maybe, maybe I, I got it wrong. I thought I saw a hand raised there. I, I can ask a question, Keith. This is Sean. Yeah. Uh, your uh, wonderful talk, your, uh Can you just say briefly uh, what's the idea of the expansion uh, microscopy approach? H how do you keep the sample that you're interested in studying from being stretched and broken horribly? <laughs> Yeah, so so okay, so the first disclaimer I should mention this is not a live cell compatible. Okay, so this is a fixed cell technique. What you do is you embed your your you embed your cell in a hydrogel. Uh, so you polymerize uh, the, the the polymer around the structures um, uh, with a very small mesh size of a couple of nanometers or so. And uh, you then break the bonds of the, the uh, neighbor and the interprotein bonds, so to uh, to uh, disrupt the cellular structure itself, but they are all remaining there because they are now embedded in this hydrogel. And then you, this is a swellable hydrogel, so by embedding it in water, it will will expand by about a factor of four or five. And this sounds too good to be true, uh, and it's not invented by us. This is invented by a lab at MIT by uh, at Boyden's lab in 2015. But it has been not show, shown now repeatedly that uh, that structures are uh, expanding isotropically as, lo as long as you're not looking at a too small scale. I mean, a single protein will not expand properly, but the, the protein to protein distances will expand isotropically. So at the 10, 20 nanometer scale, things expand uh, uh, isotropically. And uh, you can then do that iteratively. Uh, so we expand our samples 20 fold that way um, and, um, and can thereby get images which look very similar to electron microscopy images. I'll just can you um, maybe show you one image? Just yeah, uh, yeah, like this one here. You see here a synapse here uh, in the cell, um, uh, or actually the, the one before is even better. Here, this is centriole uh, at the that's at the base of of cilia in cells. This is the electron microscope image, and yes, you see more details. Um, but in the light microscope image, you see kind of the same structure now. And, and on top of that, and that's something which is very hard to do in electron microscopy. We can still apply our um, our our specific labels here and and can look at a particular protein of interest there. Thanks for asking that. Okay. Other other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi. This is Andy Shimkoviak. Um, how quickly can you use that interferometer before thermal drifts and things change the phases that correspond to a particular depth? So, um, so the you're right. I mean, this is a critical problem. We we typically image for about an hour or so, um, about the and the phase will drift, but it will not drift by much. It will drift by a lambda eighth or something like that, or lambda quarter, and we are monitoring that that drift and and are correcting for that in our data analysis later. Um, the we keep. Our, our rooms, are the, the, the room temperature is stabilized very carefully. I mean, not, not to extreme extent, but let's say plus minus a, a one degree Fahrenheit or half a degree Fahrenheit or so. Uh, and, uh, and we let our systems also settle for about an hour before we start imaging with them. Okay, so <clears throat> we're getting to uh, about the time we started about an hour later. So. If there are other questions, you can ask them, or maybe uh, you're uh, kindly offered to meet with you after after the talk if you wanted to. Uh, so it's up to you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to stay on the call for a few more minutes if there are any specific questions, but I, I also will not be angry for anyone who's leaving now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. David, if anyone has a, a question. 
So a lot of your uh, techniques are borrowed, borrowed from astronomy. And I wonder, there's another astrophysical technique, um, kind of, that depends on nature. Where you, when you uh, observe a, a scattering medium, the light is strongly reflected backwards, okay? Due to coherent uh, scattering, okay, in the medium. You were mentioning something like that earlier. Is that at all relevant to microscopy? Or, I mean, or is that always the case in microscopy? Um, there is a, there is a related technique, which we are not working on, but which is fairly popular in the, in the more medical imaging side. This is optical coherence tomography, where you, where you really look at backscattered light, um, which you then uh, interfere in a, essentially a, a, in a, in a uh, uh, a Michelson interferometer like fashion with a with a reference beam and and really can can uh, determine the, uh, the 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 depth from which the the light was back reflected and and that is a technique which is fairly popular I think in in, in, uh, in observing eye in, in eye kind of imaging like the eye in the background the retina of your eye as well as I think skin imaging uh, we are for us, scattering is a is an a nuisance or an annoyance as we, we don't like it very much, um, and we try to avoid it uh, since it's it's really distorting our our the quality of our focus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. I see. Uh, am I saying? Am I pronouncing it right? Yuki Chu. Yeah, that's me. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the great talk. I have a question related to the stat microscopy where you mentioned the uh, saturation intensity. I, I suppose this is like a feature of the fluorescence protein or whatever the fluorescence in your system. Can you give an estimate of roughly how large that is? Because I know that heating in some system is a concern is your like resolution in the equation that has like a saturation intensity in it uh that does it have to do with like heating limiting heating in, in the biological system uh, it's a very good question yeah you're absolutely right uh, this is a this is a regular concern in step microscopy um so we uh, the the saturation intensities on the gigawatt per square centimeter range. So, so these are very high intensities. Uh, but uh, please keep in mind we are working with pulsed lasers, and that's I guess one of the advantages of using that. So, so we'll have very short high intensities, um, but over time it's it's uh, uh, yeah it's it's not as bad. Plus we we it's very local. It's just in a in, within the diffraction limited area, and that focus will move fairly quickly. Um, uh, but over time, we uh, we deposit uh, the laser power that that we are focusing into the sample is in the 100 milliwatt range um, um, at any uh, on average. So it is a substantial amount of uh, power. Heating is a problem if you have strongly absorptive material in there. Um, most samples, at, if you're just talking about a few microns, are fortunately nearly completely transparent. Um, and scattering is, would not be absorption. Um, what is absorbing is, is, is pigments in skin, for example, or in, or in your iris of the eye. So if, if, whenever you image a skin section or so, then, then and you hit a pigment there, the whole sample will blow up. Yes, we have seen that. I mean, I mean you, you see later, I mean, on the microscopic level, but suddenly the whole structure is gone within a few hundred microns. You were wondering where did that go? Um, so uh, you need to watch out for that. Um, and uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is an experimental limitation. Yeah, and uh, fortunately, uh, there are enough samples. It's, it's it's a small fraction of samples which have absorptive materials in it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, were there any further? Oh, yeah. I see a hand go up. Oh. I don't know. Is Sean? Is that a new question or? No, is I was that... just clapping. I was clapping. That's my oh, clapping. clapping. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should go ahead and do that then. Maybe we should go ahead and clap. So, <laughs> thank you again, Jörg. Thank you very much for a wonderful nice, talk. Nice talk. Very nice. Yeah. Thank very you very much, much for uh, yeah listening and yeah giving me the opportunity. Was a pleasure. Thanks,
I think Karsten wanted to say something maybe, and Steve, oh, maybe not. Oh, this was also just a clap, but thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then great I'll... talk. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.